The scripture reading this morning is going to be taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 through 17. Now we request you, brethren, uh, with regard to coming to our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure to be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as, as if it is from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first. Uh, and the man of law lessens, uh, lessness is revealed, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that uh, in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that law, uh, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by, uh, by the appearance of his coming. That is the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. For this reason, God will send upon them a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, in order that they, may, uh, they all may be judged who did not believe the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. But we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren, lo beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and faith in the truth. It was for this he called you through our gospel that you may gain the glory of, of our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the uh, traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by the letter from us. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen, uh, strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. Thank you, Nathaniel. May God bless the reading of his word. It's good to see each of you here this morning. As you have heard, we have Lads Day today, so we invite all of our, our young people and uh, families to stay for Lads. And if you're visiting with us today, you are more than welcome to stay and eat lunch with us at least. You have to eat lunch somewhere, so you might as well stay and eat lunch with us. Every generation, it seems like, has certain bad things that happen during that generation, some catastrophe, that leads people to say the end must be near. In fact, about a month ago, I got a cell phone and Jared said, well, the end must be near. <laughs> You've heard talk about the Antichrist and the rapture, the Battle of Armageddon, we don't have time at this hour to discuss all of those things, but I will on Wednesday night, starting December the 22nd. We're going to talk about the revelation of the kingdom of God and the second coming of Christ, Wednesday night beginning December 22nd. What I do want to do today in the time that we have together is study this passage that Nathaniel has read for us from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn in your copy of God's Word and let's listen to God speak to us. A couple of Sundays ago I had a lesson from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, you may recall, and I pointed out that Paul wrote these two letters because Christians in the city of Thessalonica had some misunderstandings about the second coming of Christ. And so Paul wrote these two letters in order to clarify some things. You and I now read these two letters and we say, Paul, you clarified this, but you muddied that. But we're going to see what we can understand from this text. 
Jesus warned his apostles in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15 that false prophets are going to come. They're going to be dressed as sheep, but inside they're wolves. The apostle Paul warned the elders of the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20 verses 28 and 30 through 30 the very same thing. And so Paul is writing 2 Thessalonians because there are some false ideas that are being spread and Paul wants to clarify those things, especially relative to the second coming of Christ. So as we read through these and study through these 17 verses, we need to focus on what we can understand and then the things we can understand, we just have to put them on a shelf and wait for Christ to come again so that things can be more clear. I want to point out, first of all, in verses 1 through 3, that the Apostle Paul brings up the idea that the, there is a man of lawlessness who is coming, he says, but he, he's going to come before Christ comes again. Let's look again at verses 1 through 3. Paul says, Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you be not quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one at any time deceive you because that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So it's pretty clear in these three verses that Paul is concerned that the Christians in Thessalonica are being misled relative to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some believe that Jesus has already come again. In fact, when Paul writes 2 Timothy, he specifically names two Christians who were teaching that the resurrection of Christians had already taken place. Now, we don't understand exactly how all of that teaching happened, but clearly some people were teaching that the resurrection had already happened. And Paul says, I don't want you to be deceived. The day of the Lord has not come yet, Paul says, and it will not come yet until the apostasy happens. Now, the word apostasy refers to leaving the teaching of Christ. Literally, it means falling away. Falling away from the teachings of Christ, the doctrine of Christ, Christianity. So Paul says this is not going to happen until the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction. Now notice how Paul describes him in verse 4. Listen to how Paul describes this man of lawlessness. Paul says, He opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he can set himself in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Whoever this individual is, is full of pride, right? He is presenting himself as being the object of worship. Now, as Paul describes him, Paul says that this individual is a man of lawlessness. The word law, this, that phrase, let me back up for just a moment, that phrase is not found anywhere else in the New Testament. So you can't go somewhere else and say, okay, well, I'm going to study this passage so it'll help me understand who the man of lawlessness is, not when this phrase is only found here in this text. Same thing is true with that phrase, mystery of lawlessness. Notice Paul describes him as the son of destruction. That phrase is found somewhere else. It's found in John chapter 17 and verse 12, where Jesus describes Judas Iscariot, the one who was going to betray Jesus, as being the son of destruction. Judas betrayed Jesus, which set him on a course of destruction by the wrath of God for betraying the Son of God. So describe, to describe Judas as a son of destruction is to describe him as an individual whose end result is going to be destruction. Keep that in mind as we talk about who the man of lawlessness is. 
Now, there have been a lot of suggestions, a lot of ideas that have been batted around in church history all down through the time, and we don't have time to go into all of those. Let's just present the top four. Number one, some say the Pope is the man of lawlessness. This idea has been very popular among Protestants when Protestant broke off from the Catholic Church. I don't think it's the Pope of Rome. Even though the Pope of Rome does set himself up as being God because he says he is the vicar of Christ on earth and he wants people to, we would say, worship him. That's not how the Catholics would word it, but I think ultimately that's what it is. I don't think it's the Pope of Rome, even though he fits that description. Notice in verse 7, Paul says, The mystery of lawlessness is already at work. The Catholic Church didn't come along until 700 years later, several hundred years later. Paul also presents the idea here that the man of lawlessness is going to get worse and worse and worse until Jesus comes again. The Catholic Church has actually become weaker and weaker and weaker ever since the Protestant Reformation. Even in our country, the Catholic Church is not as strong as it used to be. But then there's a third reason why I don't believe it's the Pope of Rome, and that's because the, everything the Catholic Church teaches is not wrong. The Catholic Church accepts the deity of Jesus Christ, for example. They believe that abortion is wrong. So no, I don't believe, I don't believe the Pope of Catholic Church is the man of lawlessness. It might be an outgrowth of the man of lawlessness, as we will present in just a moment. Option number two is the Roman emperors. Everybody who knows history knows that the Roman emperors proclaimed themselves as God and they, they required Roman citizens to worship them as gods. They would kill Christians. They persecuted Christians because they did not accept the, the Roman emperors as being God. But I don't think it's the Roman emperor Paul's talking about. Again, Whoever the man of lawlessness is is going to get worse and worse and worse before Jesus comes again. Roman Empire doesn't exist anymore. I don't think it's Roman emperors. Option number three is Satan himself. Satan, of course, sets himself up as being God. Satan has all of the pride of someone who was with God in heaven and was expelled from God's presence because of pride. He, he opposes everything that is good and right and wholesome, and he's going to be destroyed when Jesus comes back again, right? Revelation chapter 20 and verse 10. And when I mean destroyed, I mean thrown into hell forever. But if you'll notice at verse 7, um, rather verse 9, the man of lawlessness is actually distinguished from Satan. In verse 9, Paul says his activity is in accord with Satan and all power and signs and false wonders. So the man of lawlessness is not Satan himself, but he works with Satan under his influence. So it's not Satan. Let me suggest to you number four. Paul is simply talking about evil itself. Evil personified as if it were an individual. I told you that son of destruction in verse 4 is a Jewish figure of speech to refer to somebody who has the nature of destruction that is coming. I think man of lawlessness is the same idea. It's a Hebrew figure of speech, a Jewish figure of speech to refer to someone, anyone who is characterized by lawlessness, who is characterized by being against Christ, by being against Christianity, by being against everything that is good and right and wholesome. Now, the Apostle Paul warned in 1 Timothy chapter 4, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and chapter 4, Paul warned his generation that things are going to get worse. Already, Paul says, the mystery of lawlessness is at work and things are going to get worse. But he doesn't want Christians to be deceived. Now, if you, if you take away anything from this lesson this morning, that's the point that Paul wants us to get and that's the point that I want you to get. He doesn't want us to be deceived. Jesus warned his disciples in Matthew chapter 24, leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem when there would be false messiahs come, Jesus says, I don't want you to be fooled. 
These false messiahs are going to deceive people and they're going to lead them off away from me and I don't want you to be deceived. And that's the point that Paul is trying to get here across to us. One day, family, all of those who are faithful to Christ, and as we read through this text, you ought to underline every time Paul makes reference to the truth, the truth, the truth, those of us who believe the truth and those of us who obey the truth, we're going to be saved. Regardless of what happens in our world, we're going to be saved. In Revelation chapter 5, verses 11 through 13, John sees this vision in heaven of Christians and those faithful under the Old Testament law assembled around the throne of Christ and they're praising Jesus Christ and giving Him all the glory and honor and power worthy as the Lamb who was slain who gave us victory. Paul here wants us to understand that we're going to have victory. That's what you and I need to remember about this point. But Paul goes on to say in verse 6 that you know that which restrains him now so that in his time he, re he will be revealed for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work but that which now restrains is going to do so until he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed. And then the Lord is going to slay him with the breath of his mouth. And bring to an end, bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming. The one whose coming is in accord with the working of Satan. We already pointed out in all power and Signs and false wonders. Well, who or what is this restrainer that's holding back this man of lawlessness or this mystery of lawlessness? Again, I point out that Paul says this mystery of lawlessness is already at work in the first century. So Paul is saying in his day things are bad and they're going to get worse. Every generation of Christians that comes along is going to say it's bad and it's going to get worse. Which tells us every generation has thought it's the generation Jesus is coming back again. Every generation thinks Jesus is coming back now because things are worse now than they were before. But G Paul here says that something or someone is restraining the man of lawlessness like a mad dog on a leash. Something is holding back the man of lawlessness so that he does not run free. Something is having an influence that is curbing or holding back this man of lawlessness. Who is that? Well, some of the pronouns could be interpreted as referring to a, a person. Some of the pronouns could be understood referring to a thing. Maybe it's one and both. If the man of lawlessness is just evil personified, things are going to get worse, then that which is restraining him or curbing him or holding him back would be everything that is good, everything that is holy, everything that is righteous, conservative moral influences are holding back the man of lawlessness. We're looking around our country and we see that if there's any good anywhere, whether it is in Hollywood or whether it is in Las Vegas or Washington, D.C. or New York City, that which is good, and all goodness comes from God, so God's nature is good, and everything that's flowing out of that is holding back things from getting any worse. But this verb translated, taken out of the way, carries the idea of taken out of the way by force. Now what is going to take away by force the things that are good? Again, you and I are living in a society where we feel like there are cultural pressures that are closing in on us and trying to choke the faith out of our hearts. But I suggest to you that feeling has probably been true of every generation of Christians since the Apostle Paul wrote this. When there's good forces in high places, then it's holding back evil 
from getting any worse. We go on in this text and we see where the Apostle Paul writes that the removal of the restrainer is going to allow the revealing of this man of lawlessness. Paul says then the man of lawlessness or the lawless one is going to be revealed. But notice family, this is going to give you a hint of what my Wednesday night class is going to be about. Notice family that Paul doesn't talk about a battle. There is no battle. There is no battle. Paul says when the lawless one is revealed, then the Lord will slay him with the breath of his mouth. There's no battle. Jesus shows up, and he's gone. That, of course, is referring to the power of the words of Christ. And Paul says that Jesus is going to bring him to an end by the appearance of his coming. Now again, Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 24, his generation of the coming of false prophets. And there are these here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where Paul says there are false prophets and this lawless one is deceiving people. Notice in verse 10, he's coming with Satan with all power and signs. And notice false wonders. He's working miracles that are false. They look like they're miracles, but they're really not. They look like they're wonders on the outside, but they're really not. He's deceiving. Look at verse 10. With all of the deception of wickedness towards those who perish, because, here's one of those phrases you should underline, because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. Who are those who are going to be deceived by this man of lawlessness? Paul says those are going to be deceived who don't receive the love of the truth. And then he goes on to say, For this reason God will send upon them all a deluding influence so that they will believe what is false, so that God will judge them because they did not have faith in the truth but took pleasure in wickedness. There's another phrase you should underline. They didn't have faith in the truth. You see, family, if there's anything we can understand from this text, we can understand, number one, we need to love the truth. Number two, we need to have faith in the truth. Paul says this embodiment of evil, this embodiment of wickedness is going to lead away those who don't love the truth. Jesus said early in his ministry in John 3 and verse 18 that those who believe in him are not going to be judged, but those who do not believe in him are judged already because they did not want to come to the light. They didn't love the truth. So family, you and I need to love this word from God and we need to trust this word from God and we need to obey this word from God. God is going to allow us the choice. God gives us the free choice to believe whatever we want to believe. We just can't choose the consequences of our choices. Jesus promised us in Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 to 14 that those who are going to go to heaven it's going to be few compared to those who are lost because the way to heaven is straight and narrow what does the Bible teach that's what I'm going to do that's a straight and narrow way Jesus says there's going to be few on that path but the path that, 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 that is broad and wide the path that says do what you want to do and go to the church of your choice and whatever makes you happy do it that's the path that goes to destruction and so we've got to be careful that we're not deceived and we need to love the truth and have faith in the truth and then obey the truth. David writes in Psalms chapter 1 that we need to meditate on the Word of God daily to feed our spirit daily. He writes in Psalms uh, 119 that, that, that if we hide God's Word into our hearts, we won't sin against Him. You've heard this quotation. I don't know who said it originally. This graphic uh, was Joseph Goebbels, who was uh, one of the Nazi scientists. That if, the, if a lie is told often enough, it becomes the truth in some people's minds. That's why we've got to go back to the truth. Right here and love and, and, and respect the truth because God doesn't want anybody to be saved 
but he wants everyone to come to a knowledge of the truth. But I don't want to leave this lesson on a negative note. Paul doesn't. Let's begin at verse 13. Make a few points before we draw our study to a close. Verse 13. Now we should always give thanks to God for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God has chosen you from the beginning for salvation, through the sanctification of the Spirit and faith in the truth. For this end, God has called you through our gospel to gain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Family, we don't have to be deceived. We just need to go back to the truth. We need to love the truth, obey the truth. We are chosen. We had a lesson a couple of weeks ago, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. You can go back to our website and watch that. Christ chooses us in Him. If we obey Jesus Christ, we put Christ on in baptism, then Christ adds us to His chosen body of people. That's the elect, Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. Paul here says God's chosen you from the beginning. You might have a note in your Bible that translates that phrase, first fruits, from the beginning. That's who Paul's talking about, members of Thessalonica who are Christians from the very beginning. We've got members here at Schwartz Creek who are Christians from the very beginning of the Schwartz Creek congregation. Paul says, God has chosen you from the beginning. For salvation, through what? Through what? Look at what the Word of God says. Through sanctification of the Holy Spirit. In John 17 and verse 17, Jesus prays to God, Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. So when we obey the Spirit's words in His truth right here, then the Holy Spirit pulls us out of the world and He makes us members of God's elect people, Christians. We're sanctified by the Holy Spirit when we obey His word. And faith in the truth. There's, that's the third phrase you should underline in your Bible. Faith in the truth. Notice verse 14. God calls us through His gospel. Holy Spirit didn't speak to me to ask me to be a preacher. That's not how the Holy Spirit works. It's not found anywhere in the Word of God. Nowhere. Nada. Cody, you ever read that before? Nowhere. God calls us through His gospel. That's written down. I can point to that. I can quote a scripture that says God calls us through His gospel. So His gospel message is what calls us to believe in Him and to obey His word. And notice the end result of this, he says, so that you can gain the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus has glory that He wants to share with us. We can share with Him in that glory now, 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18, but it's going to be fulfilled when we get to heaven, Romans 8 and verse 18. Paul goes on to say, here's God's part. Let's get to the end of the chapter, verse 16. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace. So let's stop right there just a moment. That's God's part. Loving everybody and giving everybody access to His Word is God's part. We sing this song, could we with ink the ocean fill where the whole sky of parchment made, where every blade of grass, a quill, every man ascribed by trade, the right, the love of God above would drain the oceans dry, nor could a scroll contain the whole, the stretch from sky to sky. Family, that's the love of God. And God's grace has given us access through the blood of Christ, through His truth. But we've got to love it. We've got to trust it. We've got to obey it. And then we bring this study to a close by looking at verse 17 where Paul talks about our part. Paul says God comforts and strengthens us. Let me go back to a verse. Paul says, So then, brethren, Stand firm. There's our part. Stand firm and hold to the traditions that you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter from us. Stand firm in the truth. This word right here. And hold to the traditions. The word tradition means something that is handed down. Literally, that's what it means. Something handed down. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 2, Paul refers to the traditions of the apostles. That's what he's referring to. Something has been handed down from Jesus to his apostles through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Hold fast to the Word of God. Whether you heard it orally or found it in his written Word. So we are responsible for knowing the Scriptures. And then we come to verse 17. Where it says, here's the end result of this. Even if the world is getting worse, and I will grant you it's getting worse during our lifetime. That doesn't necessarily give us an indication Jesus is coming next year. We just need to be faithful. Regardless of what's going on. Love the truth. Have faith in the truth. Obey the truth. And Paul says here in verse 17 that God will comfort us and He will strengthen us for every good work, helping with the food pantry, serving the sick, visiting those in prison, clothing the naked, feeding the hungry, giving water to drink to those who are thirsty, every good work and word. Teaching the Word of God to others. Sharing encouragement from the Word of God with others. Building other people up in the most holy faith. God will comfort us. And God will strengthen us for every good work and word. Jesus is coming again. We don't know when. Things are going to get worse. Probably. But he's coming again. If you turn back one chapter, one chapter in 2 Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 7 through 9, Paul says that Jesus Christ is coming again in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. I ask you this morning, have you obeyed the gospel? If you've got friends in a religious group, a different religious group, ask them that question. That's a good way to start off a Bible conversation. Ask them if they've obeyed the gospel. Most churches don't talk in terms of obeying the gospel. Not when they believe that you're saved by faith only. If you, if you believe that you're saved by faith only, there's no reason to talk about obeying the gospel. But the Apostle Paul talks about obeying the gospel. Look at it with your own eyes, black and white. It's right there. Jesus is coming. He's going to take vengeance on those who do not know God and who do not obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. Have you obeyed the gospel this morning? If you haven't, my time is your time. Let's get together this afternoon. Let's open up the Word of God and let's see what does the Bible say to do to obey the gospel. I've got a visit with the family at 3 o'clock from 3 to 4 this afternoon to get ready for a funeral on Tuesday. But besides that hour, we're also worshiping at 5 o'clock. Today at 5 o'clock, we're talking about why does God allow so much suffering? We're talking about modern challenges to the ancient faith. Why does God allow so much suffering? So from 5 to 6, I'm busy. But beyond those two hours today, my time is your time. If you've not obeyed the gospel, let's get together and talk. Because Jesus is coming again. And we want to be prepared. We don't want to be deceived. We don't want to be fooled. Let's just read the Word of God. Love it. Trust it and obey it. If you need help this morning in your relationship with Christ, let us know. Let's stand and sing together.